do the webinar on body fat and how to make it work for you instead of against you. Thank you for being here. Today, we're gonna to talk about fat cells. And I put this presentation together actually probably about three times in terms of, all right, how do, what's the best way to educate you in regards to how to burn body fat? And I decided to use this approach because I don't think we appreciate what fat actually does on our body. And as much as it's my mission to educate you about how to eat right and and exercise in order to make your body the, the best it can be. I'm also an advocate of the body because I think a lot of times we take it for granted and we get angry with it and we get angry with our bodies when we don't see the results that we want, when really every single day it fights as hard as it can to get you through each day the best that it can with what we give it. So. On that note, we're gonna jump into um, fat cells. So before you can burn body fat, we have to understand what it does in the body. So we're gonna talk about what is body fat, why you should respect it and what roles it plays, why we store it where we store it, and finally how to burn it, um, which is key. And I just put this little cartoon in here because this is one of my favorite cartoons. I said you're the good kind of fat for the avocado, which is just fun. Okay, so some facts about fat cells. So fat cells are cells and in your body and their goal, their mission is really just to store energy as fat. So your body's preferred, your preferred source of energy is fat throughout the day. Um, and we'll talk about later how to eat so that you burn it and your body can actually use it. You have 30 billion fat cells. We're born with that number of fat cells and they can expand a thousand times in volume. And this is what a fat cell looks like. So you see that it has all of these, all of the components of a cell, the nucleus and everything else. So it is metabolically active, but then it has this huge reservoir where all of the glucose and the energy get stored. And this can go a thousand times larger. You can store that much energy, which is cool. Um, and they can divide and form new fat cells. So we might start with 30 billion, we could end with 90 billion. It just depends on how we fuel our body and what's going on with our body's chemistry. A pound of fat supplies the body with 3,500 calories. So your body is always trying to store energy in your fat cells so that later when it goes through a period of famine or if you go um, through a day where you don't get enough calories, it can tap into those fat supplies and use the 3,500 calories that are stored to burn later. So when we talk about calorie in, calorie out, people are always saying, well, you need to deplete the body by 3,500 calories now in order to actually access that. Um, and that's not totally true. And we'll kind of talk about that as we go. Down here, the women need 12% body fat and men need 3% body fat. This is how much fat you need on your body in order to survive. So when you get below these percentages, this is where you go into the hospital. Um, so we don't ever want to be this low. These are not the goals. For women, a healthy body fat range is anywhere between 20 and 35%. Um, your athletes are around maybe that 14 to 16%, but anywhere between 20 and 30% is a good place. Men, anywhere between nine and 15% is probably an ideal range. Um, so though, those are the targets, but you need a certain amount of fat. So a lot of times when we're looking at your assessment and I'm talking about fat pounds and I'm looking for a range and I'll look for a number and we don't want to go below that. And I usually set people around 25 to 30 pounds because you do need fat and we're going to go over some of the other reasons why in a second. Okay. So fat cells have multiple hat disorder. Um, believe it or not, they multitask all, all day long. So just like us, they have more than one job to do and they're wearing multiple hats throughout the day. And the first three jobs are the jobs that we were the only jobs they thought that they had. So we just, you know, the science community, when I say we, science community just assumed that these were the only things fat cells did. Job number one was to hoard massive amounts of energy to be used later. And like I said, your body's preferred source of energy when we're at rest 
when we're sleeping, when we're sitting um, behind a computer, when you're listening to this webinar, is to use fat. When you're going a couple hours between meals, your body wants to tap into those fat cells. Job number two is to protect your organs and joints during physical trauma. So you have fat around your organs that if you know if you fall down or God forbid get in a car accident, that jolting, the, the fat will protect your organs. And then job number three is it functions as a natural thermal insulator. And like I said before, these were what we always thought were the only functions for fat for years. Um, let me just make sure. Okay. Okay, so, but in the last few decades, we've started to learn more. Hang on, see if I can switch this. Job number four is that your fat cells actually make hormones. And um, this is actually fascinating. And this is actually how I went from being pharmaceutical chemist to educator and personal trainer about nutrition and training is because when I worked in pharmaceuticals for hormone replacement products, Women would typically go on it in order to lose the weight that they gained as a result of menopause. Well, as it turns out, I mean, estrogen typically causes a female to have a higher percent body fat. So if you're lower in estrogen during menopause, why would you gain weight? And this is where the science is really cool because what happens is your fat cells actually can make hormones. So when a woman transitions through menopause and she's in a state of adrenal fatigue where her hormones can't, her adrenals can't keep up with the excess estrogens that it's supposed to pick up for the ovaries that are making less, your body will start to store belly fat in order to make those estrogens. So in today's world, this, this hormonal pathway this is also a big part of why we're seeing obesity today because by the age of 25, people are stressed out of their mind. So their adrenals are already tired, let alone by the time they hit menopause, everybody's overexposed to insulin. So we're already suffering from metabolic syndrome. And then we have a ton of toxins that are disrupting our hormones as well, which as a result, when those natural hormone pathways aren't there to function the way they should, your body will store fat to, to catch up, to be able to make those hormones so it can keep going. So we get mad saying, well, I'm doing everything right. I'm eating right. I'm exercising seven days a week. I should be losing fat when in reality your body's like, well, we just need to make these hormones so that we can get through the, the day and the brain can function like we want it to function and that our skin is the way that it needs to be and our eyes can blink and our heart can beat. So you know, like we get angry with it, but really it's just working to keep you going. So, um, so that's job number four. Job number five is even more awesome because we take in toxins no matter how clean we try to be. The world is full of toxins. There are chemicals around us all the time. Um, you're not going to avoid it. The person who lives in a bubble and tries to avoid every type of chemical is still exposed to an average of 500 a day. So, you know, if you drive a car, you're exposed to toxins, you're taking in exhaust. So toxins, what happens is when you take in these chemicals that your body can't process, and the perfect example is trisodium phosphate, right? It's in cereal, extends the shelf life of cereal. So we eat the cereal, you get some trisodium phosphate with that. It's not a lot, it's just a little bit, you know, FDA has found it safe, it's not going to kill us. But what happens is that starts to circulate in your system, and then that exposes all of your organs and cells, and if it keeps circulating, it can start to cause damage. So your body says, okay, we need to put this somewhere out of the way. So it stores it in this visceral fat pocket. You know, this is the fat that's around your organs. So it takes those toxins, binds it up, puts it away in your fat cells so that it doesn't hurt you, so that it keeps you safe and as disease-free as long as possible. And they tested hundreds of human fat samples, and in all of them, they found four industrial solvents and one dioxin. I mean, those are just pure toxins. They're just chemicals. Solvents are used all the time to make, um, they're in processing, processed foods in terms of the processing part of it. I mean, when I worked in the labs, we always tested for residual solvents. They were in every pharmaceutical manufacturing process. 
you just, you know, you just, they would bring it down to a certain level that would be deemed safe for you to take. And it is safe for you to take, but if your body can't process it and get, a, get it out of its system, then it has to store it somewhere. So it stores it in your fat cells. When it can't store it away, which most of the time it can, um, it's left circulating in your system where it can do damage. And a lot of times what happens is that the body's answer to pollution is dilution. So a lot of times if you're taking in food dyes and stuff like that, your body will just retain water in order to dilute down the effect of the toxins in your system. So if that, if you have any questions on any of that, because I've went through it pretty quick, just make sure you post it in the chat box and it will show up. Okay. All right, moving on. So, hang on. All right. So you have to thank your fat cells. As much as we want them gone, as much as we want them as small as possible, you do need to thank them because they are keeping you alive and they are keeping you safe and they're making hormones so that you can function and they're tucking toxins safely away to prevent disease. So you do have to appreciate them for what they do. All right, this is actually pretty cool. So this is how a fat cell stores energy. This is really how any cell stores energy. So your muscle and organ cells also need glucose to function. When you're doing bicep curls in the gym, your body's pulling the glucose from the bicep muscle cells in order to do that movement. So in a perfect world, like every time you eat, you release insulin. And insulin is basically a key that binds to a cell, which opens the door so that glucose can get stored in that cell. So ideally, you would eat breakfast and insulin would be released from the meal at a nice steady pace over the course of two hours. And as you go throughout your day and you deplete energy from your muscle and organ cells, insulin would go along and replace that energy in those cells. Now, if you get up and eat a piece of fruit and then get on the couch and you're gonna sit there for an hour, and this, then what happens is, okay, you ate the fruit, sure it's healthy, but it's full of sugar. You spike your blood sugar, your body all of a sudden has 20 to 40 grams of carbs that it has to get rid of really quickly in order to keep you functioning. So it will go along to the muscle and organ cells it can, store the glucose in there, and anything left over is gonna store in your fat cells. Versus if you got up and had a balanced breakfast, uh, um, eggs and a piece of fruit, so that you had some protein and fat with your piece of fruit, then that digestive process will take closer to two hours and it will get stored predominantly in your muscle and organ cells over those two hours. But this is basically how insulin opens the door. The more you expose your muscle and organ cells to insulin, if you get up and have the piece of fruit and then an hour later you have a cup of coffee and you fill it full of sugar and then an hour later you eat a grape and then an hour later you have a bowl of cereal. Every single one of those meals has resulted in a huge dumping of insulin in order to get that sugar put somewhere. So the first time your muscles and organ cells might be like, okay, insulin, you can put some here, but the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, the more times it gets exposed, the more resistant they become, which is how you get insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes. And your fat cells, well, they're always going to accept glucose. They're always going to take that in. And if there's not enough room in the 30 billion fat cells that you have, they're going to make more because there's no way they're going to let that energy go to waste. They're going to save it and hoard it for a later day because your body is always trying to survive. So it doesn't know that food's around the corner and that um, you, we can have access to it pretty much anytime we want. It's always anticipating the two, three week famine where it's going to need that. That's just how it's wired. All right, and then fat storage patterns. So that's how the body stores, that's how the, you get fat energy into the fat cells. Now there's some chemistry that happens in terms of where you store the fat. So in your typical female who's a pear shape, she's gonna have higher estrogen levels, which is the predominant female hormone. And as a result of those higher circulating estrogen levels, she's gonna have more fat stored in her legs and her hips. 
as this female goes through life and then heads into menopause, what happens is she's in adrenal fatigue because life has been stressful. Her adrenals can't help make, help make um, estrogen, so it puts the body under stress. So now she has elevated cortisol levels, which becomes this individual, an adrenal person. So then the body shifts and says, oh, okay, there's excess cortisol, so we're now gonna store our, most of our body fat around her waist. Um, and that's really the difference between your apple and pear. And some people are pears, and most females who are pears will transition over to apples as they age. And some people are always apples. And that's just got to do with how our each of our biochemistry is and what our hormonal makeup is. And we're all different. So um, this would be a thyroid. And this would be the, a liver or – so basically, based on how taxed your liver is, this can be the fat storage pattern. Um, so the more toxins it's had to process, the more exposure to insulin, the more likely you're going to see this fat storage pattern. But it's kind of interesting, and down the line we'll get into more of like how you can eat for each of these body types and what you can do. Um, but just so that you're aware that your body doesn't just randomly store fat. There, there are definitely hormonal reasons why that happens. Okay. So on to the good stuff, how to eat for fat loss. Um, but before we can go that, we need to talk, get clear on a few different things. So you have your metabolism, which is basically the sum of all the chemistry that your body does all day long. And every second, your body does 40 billion chemical reactions. So we talked about insulin store, storing glucose in cells, in your fat cells. Well, that's a chemical reaction. Blinking your eyes is a chemical reaction. Getting your brain to fire so that the words come out of my mouth is a chemical reaction. All of those reactions require energy. And it's the sum of those reactions that determines how many calories you need throughout the day. So the more chemistry your body can do day in and day out, the more calories you're going to need and you're going to burn. And that's important because we want our metabolism as high as possible because we want to tap into those fat cells for energy. Which brings us to the next point. In order to burn fat, your foods need to be nutrient rich because the more nutrition in a food, the more chemistry your body's going to do, the more calories you're going to burn. And that's really key. So we have a piece of chocolate and we have an apple, both 35 kilocalories, exactly the same. This piece of chocolate um, is not pure cocoa, so there's not a, a ton of micronutrients or anything in it. It's just sugar, fat, and carbs. So your body's gonna, you're gonna eat that. The insulin's gonna get released. Your body's gonna look at it and say, all right, well, all we can do is put these calories somewhere. So it's gonna get stored in organ and muscle cells or fat cells, with most of it probably going to fat cells because of how quickly the insulin response is. You have an apple, which is healthier, still predominantly all carbs, but it does have fiber and it has other nutrients in it. It has, I was looking at the micronutrient list of everything that's in an apple, and I was going to copy it and paste it, but it was pages long. Like there were over 100 compounds that are in an apple, whoops, um, which feed the other chemical reactions that your body does. So those micronutrients become key. So the apple is 35 kilocalories, but you may end up burning an extra 100 calories that day because of the micronutrients that are in it that allow your body to do more chemistry. It's the same thing like with acetylcholine in an egg yolk. So people cut out the egg yolk because it's got a little bit of fat, um, but that egg yolk is loaded with micronutrients that feeds all the different chemical reactions. So the acetylcholine goes right to the brain so that it can do different functions in the brain. And then with your amino acids, like you can make different enzymes and hormones and repair your digestive tract. So if you're deficient in these micronutrients because you're just eating more of the processed foods, like the breads and the pasta and anything that man has predominantly created, then you're gonna be low in the micronutrients, which is gonna slow down your metabolism overall. So a calorie is not just a calorie. We used to think that um, back in the 80s, 90s, when we had the low fat craze and they took the fat out of all the foods, this was the thinking. And I have shared this story with people where I was sitting in taking um, a nutrition class and taking biochemistry and they were having this conversation 
about how the body doesn't need fat, it's just calories. And in biochemistry, I was learning about the importance of the essential fatty acids that you could only get for, from food in order to feed the different chemical reactions that your body does. So clearly it didn't add up. The calorie, the calorie is not just a calorie. So it's about so much more than that. Hopefully that makes sense. So number one, make sure your foods are nutrient rich, rich as possible. The more close it is to being something that you can just go outside and get, the more nutrient rich it's going to be. Number two, you must drink more, you must drink water. And this was in the email that went out on uh, Monday and it's up on our Facebook page and it's on the FT blog. Actually, it's in a few different places. And I talked about how if you're not getting enough, I mean, basically, let me back up a second. Basically, all of your cells are 70% water. So every chemical reaction happens in water. So if your brain needs water because the brain is actually 80% water. It is going to pull water from your fat cells and stop your body from burning fat because it's not hydrated enough. So one of the most, I mean, water is the only thing you can't live without. It's the only thing you can't live without. So you have got to get this thing consistently. You need to drink half your body weight in water every day, seven days a week. Um, you have to be hydrated in order to burn fat. And then the water, again, helps your body to eliminate the toxins so that you're preventing toxic fat, where it's just fat, it's just toxins stored in your fat cells, filling them up. Um, that's really key, <laughs> that's really key. Number two, you really need to regulate insulin. So we sh I showed you in that picture where insulin is really, its only job is to store energy. It stores glucose all day long every time you eat or drink something. So you need to keep that balanced and controlled as much as possible. And in order to do that, you need to eat protein at every meal. It really helps to keep your blood sugar very stable. The other thing that's important about protein, which a lot of people don't realize, is that your body needs amino acids in order to make glutathione, in order to take the toxins that are circulating in your body and bind them up so that they can bind to fiber and you can get rid of them. So if you're deficient in protein, if you're not getting enough of that, that is where you'll also get more toxins stored in your fat cells. So protein's important from that. And your amino acids, you can only get through food. There are nine essential amino acids. You can only take them in from food. Your body can't get them another way. So that's really key. The other thing a lot of people don't realize is every time you eat protein, it speeds up your metabolism 30% because your body can do more chemistry. So, and it's every time. If you want a faster metabolism, eat more protein. Um, these numbers down here, these are bare, bare bone minimum. Women need 60 grams of protein daily. Men need 80 grams of protein daily. Really, um, most people would say, a woman would need 0.8 grams of protein per body weight. A man would need one gram of protein per body weight. That can be excessive and it can be hard to hit. There are no health um, hazards to eating that much. But these, these are the minimum targets in order to get enough. And protein deficiency is one of the biggest things that cost people their health and results in fat storage. Meal timing. This is key. Uh, the body wants to burn fat. It's designed to burn fat. It's designed to store fat. It's designed to burn fat. But you have got to make sure that your meal timing is, on, is good, it's, it's on point. First thing is when you wake up, you need to eat as fast as, pos as fast as possible. Never wait more than an hour to get food in your system. Breakfast is literally break fast. So you don't start your metabolism until you eat. Your body's not doing chemistry until you eat. You're not burning calories until you eat. So you have got to get up and eat. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't like to eat breakfast because I'm more hungry through the day. And that hunger actually means you're burning calories. So that's a good thing. Hunger pains are definitely your friend. Um, again, you always wanna make sure your meals are balanced with protein and carbs. You do want fats balanced too, but mostly if your protein and carbs are on point, you'll be good to go. I kind of let fats fall where they fall. And then you do want to eat every three to four hours. So ideally, you'll eat, a you'll eat a meal that's balanced in protein and carbs, and then you'll wait 
three to four hours and then you'll eat that next meal. And that what will happen is it will take two, roughly two hours for your body to use up the energy in the first meal. And then you'll go that next hour or two where your body is tapping into your fat stores for the energy. And that's where the fat burning comes in, which is good. If you go six hours without eating, well, now you've put yourself in a famine state. Your blood sugar's gotten too low. And no matter what you eat, your body's more likely to store it. So you don't ever want to go six hours. You really want to fall in that three to four hour time frame. That's really, that's key. And that consistency is key. Um, no snacking between meals. Again, your body's preferred source of energy is fat, but it costs the body a tremendous amount of energy to burn fat. It will try not to burn fat as much as it can. So if you are eating a grape in between meals, then when you eat that grape, your body's like, oh, thank goodness, we don't have to go through that process of burning fat. We can just use the sugar from the grape. So you want to keep that in mind. Every time you snack between meals and it's unbalanced, like you're going to stop your body from burning fat. It, it, um, Cause it's always thinking about survival down the road. And if it can save the fat for as long as possible, it's going to, because it's trying to preserve you and save you for something that's not planned for. So in order for everything to work correctly, you really need to, make not snacking a habit you just don't need it you've got your fat stores and then embrace your hunger pain so when that two those two hours go by and that third hour is coming up or whatever that time frame is for you and you start to get really hungry well that's your body's defense saying hey uh we're gonna have to burn fat unless you feed us so if you could just grab something right now then i don't have to burn any fat so when you're hungry you need to look at that as a good pain, say, oh, I'm gonna tap into some fat burning here, and then give your body the opportunity to burn the fat. So I always tell people, like if you're on that three hour line, like go 30 minutes. You, know, you don't have to push it out as long as possible because you wanna keep your metabolism going, um, but embrace those hunger pains for 30 minutes. Drink some water, just let them go, let your body burn the fat, and then eat your meal. But a lot of times we, get panicked and as soon as we're hungry we're like I, I have to eat um, but unless you are in the process of passing out or you can't stand up because you're getting too shaky you really don't need to if you're just feeling a little hungry and it's annoying just go with it because you're gonna burn fat that's good okay so that's those are the food pieces this is a key piece, actually. Um, if you've got all the food pieces on point and you're not burning fat, then it comes back to one of these factors. Like I said, your fat cells make hormones. And whether you're eating right or not, if you're struggling with um, elevated cortisol levels or another hormonal imbalance, your body will store fat in order to help with that hormonal production. So chronic stress, and chronic sleep deprivation both lead to elevated cortisol levels have both been proven to increase the amount of belly fat that you have. So if, if that's an issue, that's a situation that we have to try and rectify. And that's something that we can go offline and set up a meeting one-on-one -on -one, um, to deal with, whether it's sleep or stress. But these are areas that have to get fixed in order for your body to become healthy enough to burn fat because right now it's focused on survival and it every function in your body is based off of hormones so if you have a hormonal imbalance fat burning is the last thing on its mind um, so you have to try and change that situation if it's stress um, or sleep deprivation on account of stress things to try meditation and yoga those are both very good Counseling. So if you're carrying a lot of stuff around and it's just gnawing at you all the time, you, you need to get it out. You can't keep carrying it. So counseling or finding a good friend to talk to or a safe place um, to get that stuff out is key. Changing your perception. The number of times we get stressed out over little stuff, sitting in traffic, I'm going to be late for a meeting. Well, you're just sitting in traffic and you're going to be late for a meeting. It's really not the end of the world. Um, there are much, much worse things that can happen to us at any given moment. So make sure you're recognizing whether or not 
the stress that you're feeling at that moment if it's appropriate. And sometimes we just need to change our thinking about the situation. When I used to work in the lab, I used to get really stressed out when things didn't go as planned. And then I started sitting on a stability ball and then I would get stressed out and start to bounce on that ball. And then I would be like, well, really, how serious can it be if I'm sitting at work bouncing on a ball? And that would help change my perception. So you need to just look at that situation. Um, get outside. Uh, you know, when you get outside and get outdoors and hike and do things like that, it's proven to help change your brain chemistry and to help it relax and bring your stress hormones down. And then strength training more often, cardio less often. Strength training is really the only thing that brings cortisol levels down. As long as you're not really going over 45 minutes or the intensity is not too, too, too crazy. Um, and chronic excessive cardio is definitely shown to elevate cortisol levels. So you want to make sure um, that you have a balance there. Okay. So that was a lot. Um, these are the five key points that you have to do consistently in order to effectively burn fat day after day. You, you know, you've got to be 90% on point and really make it a priority. These are, they're not really hard things to do. I, I mean, we have thousands of books in the bookstore making all of this as complicated as it can when really the body responds it's it's the body's super complicated but it responds to the simplest things and if you're just consistent with them you'll see great results and i see it time and time and time again so five keys to fat burning half your body weight in water every day you just you have to find a system that works for you in order to make this happen for me it's a three liter jug on the on the counter I fill it up every morning. Every morning, I'm like, okay, by the end of the day, that has to be gone. Then I know I hit my water. If I don't hit it, then I, I know I might be up a few times during the night because I drink it before I go to bed. Carbs always need protein. If you're going to have a bowl of popcorn at the end of the night, that's fine. Drink a protein shake with it. Just always balance your carbs so that you're regulating insulin and keeping it stable so that your you're, so that you're not just causing everything to get stored in your fat cells. Protein alone is okay. Um, you know, that, that's fine. If you just want to grab a piece of chicken and gnaw on that, that's perfect. Um, you want to stay away from chemicals. So watch for no fat, low fat, zero fat. Read your labels. You should be familiar with every ingredient on your label. If you're not, that's something that your body's going to have to figure out how to bind and get rid of or it's going to tuck it in your fat cells. So you just, you really want to watch that. And that comes back to that nutrient density where a calorie is not, a calorie is not just a calorie. Um, you want as whole foods as much as possible. More vegetables, the better. And no snacking between meals. No snacking between meals. It's once you make it a habit, it's really simple to keep it a habit. And then manage your stress. If your stress is good and your sleep is good, following those the four steps above it consistently day after day, you're going to get results. And day after day being 90% of the time, you know, nobody's perfect. We're not striving for perfection. We're just striving to keep these things as consistent as possible. And, yeah, so that's all of it. Um, if there are any questions, um, you can either post a question. And uh, Carolyn, did you have a question? I saw you raised your hand. Can you hear me? <laughs> did I raise my hand? You yes, did. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm in my basement. <laughs> Folding laundry. Oh, all right. All right. Well, my dog um, got excited. Oh, bring your dog. Um, yeah. I, I have a question. So for breakfast, <laughs> recognize yeah. my voice. For, yeah, for breakfast, is it most important to have protein? Yes. Hey. If I'm going to go, if I'm going to go spinning, you know, I like to spin. Yeah. I so try to get. A breakfast in before spinning. Yep. So protein. 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 I, I'll have an egg. 
also I'll take, I'll either have a, a, a two bullet shake with vegetables and a protein in it with a hard boiled egg, or I'll have um, an, um, I'll saute uh, with a little bit of coconut, uh, organic coconut oil, some spinach, um, egg, and then I'll have uh, some whole wheat toast. That seems to be better than like oatmeal before I spin. Yeah, much, much better than oatmeal. So for, you definitely want protein in the first meal of the day because that sets up your okay. hormones for the day. So that's key. Okay. And then you definitely want protein um, in your meal prior to working out because it keeps your body in a positive nitrogen balance. So then it prevents you from breaking protein down during the workout. Okay. Whereas a lot what of about you just have oatmeal, you don't have any protein there, so it doesn't keep you in a positive nitrogen, nitrogen balance. So if you're in the workout and the body's like, well, I need amino acids to do this, it might uh -huh. break down muscle from somewhere else in order to do it. What if I have oatmeal and also a protein shake? I mean, like a, I'll have the protein powder that you guys have with water with it. Is that, yes. but the, are the eggs better? Um, no, either one is fine. But I have well, to the, have the, protein the, egg, the eggs are going to be more nutrient rich, you know. Okay. So an egg is probably better overall, um, but if, right. if you need to mix it up, that's fine. You can do a shake too. A lot of times, I'll put protein powder in my oatmeal. Okay, I try that. It gets a little clumpy. It but. can. <laughs> it can. Most um, of the time, I just drink it. I just mix it in water and drink it. That's how I do it, you too. What about when I'm finished working out? Should you have, when you finish working out, within that hour after you work out, is that when you should put protein back in your body again? Yeah, if the goal is to build muscle, if the goal is to build muscle, um, right. then you want to have that post-workout shake within an hour. So then you want to put definitely want protein in there because you want to what happens is when you work out you deplete all of your cells of all of the glucose of your muscle cells right so then you want okay. to put that protein in within an hour after your workout so that you can replenish all of that um, and okay and help build the muscle and prevent further muscle breakdown if the goal is fat loss then you don't you know it, if the goal is purely fat loss, like I've got 40 pounds of fat I want to lose, then that yeah. protein shake right after your workout is not as important because you want the body to tap into the stored fat. Okay. okay. Oh, all right. Okay. That makes sense then. Okay. Yeah. So it really you. depends on what the goal is for the, and what the, who the individual is. So. Okay. For me, I, I want to build more yeah. muscle. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. This cool. is very interesting. I love this is an awesome, awesome presentation. Oh, really thank good. you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's really weird not being able to talk to people and to just talk to the computer, but I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah, well, your head is only like a half an inch, so it's weird. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's different, but it's good. Cool. It's good. All right. Thank cool. you, Carolyn. Thank you. Hey, Ellen, can you hear me? I can. Um, All right, we can hear you. Oh, good. Um, I had one question. I mean, I, I aim to drink eight glasses minimum of water a day. I'm a good water drinker. But I'm just a little bit confused about the half your body weight in water. Because is that like 70 pounds of water? Um, it's in ounces. I'm sorry about that. It's, 70, it's half your body weight in ounces. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, yeah, 70 pounds. Of <laughs> <laughs> that might be painful. That uh, might be a lot of water. Possible. <laughs> yeah. It's half okay. your body weight in ounces. Okay, totally cleared up. Very yeah. great. I love this presentation. It really, even though I did that, you know, it's some of it's um, not new information, yeah. but good to review and get it again. And this is organized really great. Um, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Um, I believe Ham asked if this would be available to review, and 
I will definitely make the presentation available. I was going to email that to you all as well as I put together a protein sheet of what proteins are and what's in a three ounce serving, how many grams of protein um, or an ounce serving, depending on what the item was. So I was going to send that over to all of you by email. Um, and then Pam also asked what do you recommend to eat before workout and really a protein shake is good. I tell a lot of people Greek yogurt is good. Um, one of my favorite pre-workout meals, honestly, that really seems to hold you over for a workout is the Power Crunch Bar. It's just got it's it's just got the right amount of fat and protein to really carry carry you through the workout and keep you in a positive nitrogen balance. But a Greek yogurt with fat in it or a Greek yogurt with some nuts, like six to nine nuts, is always good pre-workout as long as it's you're okay with dairy and it's far enough ahead. Um, and a lot of times people will just drink a protein shake as well. So if nobody has any other questions, then um, Thank you for joining up, joining me, and I'll get this all out to you by email, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks.